I'm a little bit frustrated with all my attempts to get buzzing noise out and get the sound right here. But <laughs> let me try this video again. I just made a whole one and now I've got to do it again. This video is about contract, about terminal value again. It follows up part one of the video and in part one of the video spent a lot of time saying if the terminal value is at different levels how does it affect the bid price and I kind of almost assumed that a hundred percent where the terminal value is a hundred percent of the capex that might be a reasonable number I didn't say that but I didn't not say it either and in this video we're going to see what's kind of a reasonable terminal value now excuse me i'm going to do this for two different cases case one will be what happens if we just extend the terminal value case two will be what happens if we use spot prices and have a merchant market where prices are we have no idea so the first case is just going to say how, what happens to the value of my plant if it's in the middle of its life? How should we, uh, uh, if, if, if we assume the plant has a similar function as it does today, but it only has half of a life left, how much should the terminal value be without considering the kind of economics of supply and demand and all that? Now, it might sound that that's pretty straightforward. And but it's not pretend you're going for a contract extension and you are negotiating with this regulator these nice people and they said oh look we gave you this capital recovery this recovery this fixed charge this thing that's going to cover your EBITDA we gave you that in the first contract we already paid for the plant you don't deserve any 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 contract extension just run the plant for and and just get your o and m back and be happy and the spv says no you idiot he doesn't they don't say it like that they say you know that's fine but i think we're going to shut down the plant if we don't earn any money if we don't get anything more than our o and m there's no reason for us to run the plant Let's get a little more nuanced. If the SPV, the owner of the plant, can say, oh, you know what? We were really nice in that first PPA. You don't understand it. We lowered our PPA because we thought you were going to be rational. We lowered it so we could get, because we knew the plant is going to have some long-term value, and we knew you were going to make sense. And if the plant is almost as good as new today we lowered the value by a lot we lowered the bid price by a lot because we knew that you would give us the same kind of ppa contract as a new plant gets and by the way we took the risk of all that now the regulator says yeah sure and 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 they say look we're going to give you enough money just to keep your plant open we know you could close it and sell the site and sell some of the parts move some of the parts you could do some stuff and get a little bit of value for your plant but it's stuck it's here that's going to be an expensive proposition you're going to have to decommission stuff and so we're going to give you just enough money to make you have an incentive to keep it open and not sell it so there are these kind of different levels we could start at zero that's not going to happen because then you'd close it down We'll give you a little bit to keep you from selling the plant, or we'll give you the relative value of the plant compared to a new plant. It's got less value because it's less efficient. I don't know if this is here, here, or here, or maybe it's here. Maybe it's all the way up here. It could be any of this, but there's a decline. It may be lower because, as I can tell you, my efficiency is not what it used to be. Uh -huh. My remaining life isn't there either, but <coughs> as I just made this video for the second time, because I was an idiot, because I can't seem to get a microphone, I'm making bad decisions, my O&M cost is going up, I have to be maintained a lot more, 
and I have to go into the hospital and get uh, refurbished. <laughs> I did have to do that. Unfortunately, they can't do that to my brain. So we're going to uh, uh, kind of do some different analysis where we look at, uh -huh, let's make some different scenarios about the plant value declining. Now I'm going to get to the Excel. And then we're going to, once we have these plant values, we're going to see, okay, what's the, here's the, here's the little thing, uh, here's the contract extension value, not a very pretty uh, spreadsheet. And we're going to see, okay, what's the value of this plant, this one guy who tells me I, my website sucks and everything else. He tells me, oh, don't put grid lines in ever. Okay, as if that makes a big difference. So this decline scenario. Now, if I insert a line, this notice how the row and the, co the row start and end change. Then this is no decline. Uh, D decline, and this is a fast decline in, in the efficiency. And this is maybe a, a, a medium and, and, and a, you look at me. See, I told you I'm declining. And this is a, 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 a big decline. Oh, oh, God, that was horrible. But there are different scenarios of how fast our efficiency is declining. And then we need to array that against real rates. Now let's see how this model is structured. So now let's say our life of our project is going to be 50 years. Now don't think that's so long. If your life is 20 years, you know, 20 years ago was in about 1997. That does not seem that long ago. I think there were even text messages back then. I'm not sure. Maybe. I know the internet existed back then. But I know I could not imagine a plant built in 1997 being retired. I was just on an airplane because my plane got delayed and, and, and for five hours. And that plane, it was a new plane. It was A380, but it looked like it was, you know, it was, I think they're 10 years old now. It doesn't seem like that. But if you assume a plane only lasts about 20 years, that's half its life. I don't think, uh, whatever, that was kind of stupid. But whatever. Now let's, let's put a real rate, discount rate of uh, 4%. Now, I've got to run a goal seek. I'll explain that in a minute. Now, we have different possibilities of decline. This is our kind of really fast decline, I guess. This is our thing where we don't decline much, and then at the very end, we decline really fast, and this is where we decline at different rates. Now, I love this thing where I use the first one. I just said, okay, we're just 100%. We don't decline. I'm just as productive as I was before. Maybe I'm like a old wine. Maybe you get more uh, uh, productive with age. This one says, no, you get the efficiency as measured by the heat rate and the O&M required costs and everything else. If we rent this plant out, we're going to spend less for an old, we, we'd pay less rent uh, on an old plant than a new plant. The rent is like this capital recovery thing we're doing. Now, when we do this sort of analysis, you've got to inflate the capital recovery. You can't, because if you buy a new plant, you're going to compare your old plant to a new plant, and there's going to be some value that just goes up because of inflation. Your plant, if you, if you have a 10-year-old plant and there was an inflation and a new plant costs a lot more and your plant is just as efficient as the old plant, you'll pay the same rate. So you've got to include the some inflation in this kind of base capital recovery that I'll explain. And then I love these interpolate lookup. I'm being arrogant. Because there should, in the lookup function was so good, they should have allowed you to interpolate. And that's what I did here, is allowed an interpolation and allow either, I'm, I'm kind of clicking it, sorry about that, I, either a linear interpolation where it goes straight down or kind of a compound growth 
interpolation where it gradually where, where it goes down in a compound growth kind of way and you can experiment with either of these and I'm not going to spend too much time but if you go to chapter one Excel utilities and then you find this lookup you have to copy this function into the Excel okay now once we have all of this then we can say, okay, now let's take our initial capital recovery and decline it because we're going to pay less rent because we got less productivity. And if I put it on the first decline factor, which is just, this is all working with just the index function, I hope. This is just an index function as usual. Okay, and then we get different possibilities of how much we decline. And then we say, okay, when do we renew this contract? So you go, in this case, in year 22, and you go out to year 50. I said, we're going to last 50 years. You might say, no, we're going to do this differently. And when you do this, you have to press the goal seek. The reason you have to press the goal seek is really important. If you know your plant is going to decline, you're going to charge more money in the first years and less in the last years. So you've got to redo the... It's kind of like the whole terminal value thing. If you're going to have a bigger terminal value, you're going to have less capital recovery in the first years. So you've got to kind of redo this to get that real uh, 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 discount rate or real target IRR or whatever you want to call that. Uh, now, once we have that, and so in this case, which is a really good case, we get 35% if we don't have a decline, if we have a decline in efficiency, instead of 35, we get 26%. If we have another decline, we have 13%. It depends on how you think the efficiency will change over the time because the regulator is not going to, I assume it's not, if you have a less efficient plant, they're not going to give you more than a, a rental rate. They're not going to give you a capital recovery that reflects a the the new plant because you're less efficient and then so this is where we did a, a data table and as usual the data table makes a a, a, a it's a macro and then it re uses a goal seek and i had to recopy this data table because we're using a different goal seek and we use a goal seek to figure out what this set the NPV to zero by changing this capital recovery on the plant. And then we can kind of see more reasonable, perhaps, results. Maybe a 5% is a reasonable discount rate, maybe a 4%. And we can see if we don't have a decline, we get about 38%, nowhere close to 100%. If we have our second kind of medium case, oh, excuse me, we have a, uh, we have a bigger decline and so on and so forth, okay? That's the kind of basic uh, case. And I kind of put some of these in the spreadsheet, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, PowerPoint slides. Now, let's do the case where we have spot prices instead of Real, just ne renegotiating a contract extension. Now, this is a different case because if there are spot prices, we're not stuck with a contract. We can do whatever we want. We are not limited by the contract provisions. We're free. I don't think you know what I'm talking about, but maybe you can find an analogy. We're free to do whatever we want. Now, here's the point. Anybody who thinks they can predict things in five years, I think, is a fraud. Anything predicting in ten years, you're more than a fraud. You're, you're, you're just a complete imbecile. Anything you predict life in 20 years? Oh, my <coughs> Maybe there weren't text messages 20 years ago, but life looked a whole lot different. There was certainly no such thing as a, one of these phones that I see everybody using. There was no, you know, you might be had a flip phone or something like that. There, to, to, to say that you can predict things 20 years out, what a fool! 
no, that, but we still have to predict terminal value. What are we going to do? We have no idea if there will be contracts or spot markets in electricity or anything else we might think. Now, what we can do, though, is we can recognize that, that the spot markets will be totally unpredictable. And then we can recognize, too, that if they're unpredictable, we have the options to do things. So here I made a, oops, I made a picture of a plant that's on fire. And here's what you can do when it's on fire. You can abandon the plant. Just, uh, okay, tear it down, throw it away somewhere. Okay. But what you can do is you can spend a whole lot of money on this. And if the price is really low, that's a pretty stupid thing to do. Because you're going to make a negative IRR. But if the price is low, what you can do is let this deteriorate. Don't waste a lot of money on maintenance. Just let it go. And here, what you can do here, there's another example. You just don't pay insurance. If the price is really low, why would you pay insurance? That's the real options. You have options to operate your plant with different fixed and variable costs. And if the price is high, you might pay fixed costs and get it refurbished. If the price is low, don't pay any fixed cost. Just keep it going until it dies out and use a different strategy. And if the price is really low, retire the stupid thing. Okay? And that uh, option means you can get out of something. Normally, it's the option to abandon. It's the option to leave. That's the real option normally. And we can have the option to, to, to finish. And now options are worth a lot more if there's more uncertainty. So if you think there's really, you have no idea about the future, at least you want to, you can get a range in value and you can realize that the value is more, the value is more, the value is more because you have the options. You can get all fancy with Monte Carlo simulation. What a waste of time that I used to do that so much. I was totally addicted to Monte Carlo simulation. But now if we have a, a wind farm or a solar project and we think we get a little terminal value from that, what we do is we look at alternative and I put some US and I said, okay, I'm going to look at Philippines, Europe, Australia. I've got I went crazy. I love getting all this data on all these merchant markets and there's so many good stories. It's Hard to imagine. And what you can do is you can look at the electric price and the gas price. And over here, it doesn't look like they're that correlated. Then you can do this heat rate we'll talk about. But if you look at a, a, a month by month, you see they're really highly correlated. And if you look at this market, look at the gas and electric price, how co correlated they are. All you're doing is predicting the gas price. What a waste of time. What I used to do is predict all these prices. You're just predicting the gas price in this market. And then you can compute something called the heat rate, the market heat rate. The market heat rate, if you've got a, 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 a wind farm, you don't care about it. You care about the absolute price. If you've got a, 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 a NGCC, a, a gas plant, you care about the price of electricity versus the price of gas. You can take the price of electricity, divide it by the price of gas, USD per megawatt hour divided by MMBTU, and that gives you the market heat rate. I just did it again, why I did it twice. And then you reciprocate or whatever and cancel out the, 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 the USDs, and you get MMBTU per megawatt hour. That's the heat rate. That's the heat rate in the market. And if you, so in this case, if you have 56 divided by 8, you get 56 divided by 7. 7 times 8 is 56, I think. I never used to get that right. And then you can take this, uh, you can do it the other way. If you know the market heat rate and your heat rate is lower, you're going to dispatch. <coughs> Excuse me. If it's higher, you're not going to dispatch. But if it's lower, you're going to run the plant and the profit you get is going to be the market heat rate minus your heat rate times the gas price. And this proves it all. Okay, this says 8 times... The, mar the gas price, 56 minus 7 times uh, uh, 6.7 is 9.1. We can do the same thing with this formula. Now, we're, I'm going to make a model with this. 
And in the model with this, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you how to put a real option. This maybe maybe should have said model model with real options. Now, of course, this is on the the website uh, in advanced modeling. Okay, in, under terminal value, and now this. Huh, I gotta take a break. Hmm. Now, what we first of all doing is admitting we don't know what this market heat rate will be. We're fooled to think we know it, what it will be. Maybe there'll be a whole bunch of efficient plants, and maybe we'll have surplus capacity. Uh, I there. This is part of a kind of another project where I go through all these heat rates. Here's what happened in Neepool. New England. Oh, look at this annual heat rate. Look at how it went rocketing down and everybody went bankrupt after that. Um, look what happened in, New, in, in Midwest U.S. And then we can take other markets. A really high heat rate everybody built. Ooh, it went down forever. Even in our famous California study, heat rates were enormous. They were high here. Everybody, of course, built, and the heat rates went way, way down for many, many years. So we're going to try to predict what the kind of market heat rate is, and there are all sorts of wonderful lessons in all of that data, really good lessons. So we don't know. Maybe it's going to be high. And then I'm going to put a PPA period of 21 years, and a project life of 50 years, and then we're going to see what the value of our project is if 60% of the time we get these really high heat rates, or if scenario two, it's about equal, or scenario three, we get low, or worst case, we get all this really bad heat rate, and then we just use the index function. This just uses the index function with our little thing, and whenever you see a drop-down box, so this is our next scenario. You're probably having the index function. This should be called the brother of the index function. And once you have these, you make a little model, a little bit more complicated model. Start with kind of a normal kind of capital recovery in the first instance. And then uh, you go to year 21 and you recover your money with with the, the market heat rates on a merchant basis. And on a merchant basis, you better look at these kind of, even in Africa, we're probably going to have some merchant markets in Singapore, in, 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 in ooh, Korea, kind of, maybe, in Philippines, in, they're talking about it in Malaysia, in all over. Colombia was the first one. Chile was one of the first ones. I don't know which one was first. They were all first before the UK. UK didn't invent this stuff. It was started in, in South America. Okay. So then we can say, ah, I'm going to, 60% of the time, I'm going to have a high heat rate if we have this kind of high merchant one. And then if I have a base merchant one, we change our probabilities have no idea what they are going to be. You can try to Monte Carlo simulation essentially give you those, but it doesn't really do much unless you really know something amazing. Then we're going to take for each of the merchant scenarios, we're going to take and use a maximum function because we're not going to dispatch when they're negative. That's why we, that's got a real option in it already. And we're going to take this heat rate minus our heat rate, which is 6.7, and multiply it by the gas price, and then we better subtract the variable O&M cost. That's going to give us our margin per megawatt hour, and then we 60% of the time we're going to get this one, 40% this one. And, <laughs> great, this doesn't seem to uh, add up, does it? I better uh, fix that. Okay, whoops. I made that mistake on purpose. Sure. Okay, and then, uh, um, uh, uh, oh no, and then now once we have that, then we have the uh, margins and we cut off the margins. Now if we have a, uh, let me see, a, a small investment and we 
do a really low maintenance, we get no margin when the heat rate is really low. Because hmm. that's lower than our, 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 uh, hmm. our, ma- our, our, it's not worth running. We turn it off. If we do medium maintenance, we still get nothing. If we do high maintenance, we, we're going to make our plant really work well, so it's even going to give us a low heat rate. And then we put all this together and only multiply it when we have our extension period, and then we get our total kind of value during the extension period, and it's all very speculative, of course. Interesting thing here is this one gave us 35% of our initial value. I need to kind of finish this off. We make an outflow of cash, perhaps. This is an outflow for refurbishment, and then we get inflows. Now, this all depends on what kind of outflow you're going to use for refurbishment and how much you're going to, it's going to spend to get your, the plant looking like new. You can make all sorts of different assumptions. I'm not saying I made the right one. So in one case, I said we make a large investment and we get, spend a lot on fixed O&M and we, get, we spend a lot on refurbishing costs and we get a really good heat rate. We make a smaller investment, we don't get such a good heat rate, and we have to spend more on variable O&M. We make no investment, we get a really, really bad heat rate. Now, that might be too bad, okay? Whatever. So this might not really be the, you know, you'd have to be really careful with what kind of heat rates you're going to get and what kind of merchant prices you're going to assume and all that stuff. Now, you then go through and you say, okay, I'm going to put one for the merchant, two for the low merchant. These are our merchant prices. These are our strategies. And we make a data table as usual. We just copy the data table and we just put in the row, the row end, the column start and the column end and then name all the ranges. I talked about that in the last video. I'm not going to talk about it again. And the interesting thing, if you think it is, if we have a high merchant price, we should make a large investment, even if we have a medium one. I'm going to have to rerun this because I changed the things around. So this just reran the data table, okay? And then we, in, in this case, though, with the low merchant, it's better to not do any maintenance. That strategy of letting the turbines fall apart and burn. And then if the price is really low, the best thing to do is retire. These are our real options which work differently with different market prices. Here are the market prices. Here are our strategic options. And we can say, okay, this average is what we're going to get if we make a large investment. We're going to get this much as a percent of our terminal value. It's pretty low. Maybe too low, but whatever. And if, if we retire the plant, we're, we're going to get nothing. If we make a small investment, our average is going to be 11.46. So maybe we should make a small investment, a small maintenance. This seems the best strategy. But we should account for if we think the merchant prices are going to be high in year 20, fine. We, don't, we still don't know them, of course. Don't think I made the mistake with saying, okay, we're going to know exactly the merchant prices for the rest of the life, but we have a better idea about it then at least. We're going to take the maximum. So in this case, we use the large investment, large investment, small investment, retire. And then our average, when we have a real option, this value, this 14% versus these, is the value of the option to do different things. And it's easy to put that in the model. And then you get your values, which are probably a little bit low here. And then finally, what we really should do is we should also see if our market prices are reasonable. To see if your market prices are reasonable, put zero in for a heat rate, put in the life of the project, and then put in a, 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 a kind of a good working plant. And then in our base merchant case, we get an IRR of 7.66%. That says these merchant scenarios and these probabilities produce a reasonable IRR. It's a reasonable case. If the price was low, like in this this one, and we get 1.9%, nobody will ever build. That's not a viable long-term scenario. You don't have to do these enormous consulting studies. 
You have to see if your merchant price scenarios are consistent with an IRR. And if we put this high case in, then we get a, a pretty high IRR. Maybe you can say that's a reasonable IRR too. Maybe you can say that's a reasonable case. That's how you can judge whether your kind of case is reasonable. Now, if, you, if I put, let's put like 50,000 in. So I tried to make this kind of a real, uh, 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 kind of like a, a real combined cycle analysis. Maybe that's too little, but whatever. Let's re redo this table. You just click on this table, and I'm sure now we almost always do our first one. Ooh. And uh, if we have a high merchant price, we get a really good number. So I guess if you make really aggressive merchant price scenarios, and you don't have to spend much on refurbishment, you could get 78% of the value. I think that's too aggressive, but you can kind of think through that. And it, again, depends on the discount rate. Where's our uh, discount rate somewhere here? Uh, come on. Okay, I put this. Uh, but this was a pretty high discount rate. So if we put a 7%, uh, 6%, and we redo this table, okay. Uh, we get some different answers, a higher answer, okay? I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that right now. These, You can see the trickiness, and you've got, because you really have to understand what kind of expenditures you might have to make to keep this plant really going. That's the, that's the real issue. And, and what kind of heat rate you really see in the market for a new plant. Okay, enough of that. 31 minutes, not so bad.